By the time the Second World War came round in 1939, uh, Dennis was already in his early 40s, probably not very fit. He loathed ball games and um, being a wine merchant, he quite liked his drinks. So I think it's fair to say that uh, he probably wouldn't have run 100 yards in uh, record time. But what he did think was that as a, an already world famous author, um, he might be of use to the Ministry of Information in writing propaganda and such like. So he wrote them. In fact, he wrote twice and he didn't get a reply. So he spoke to a friend of his, a man called Maxwell Knight, who was very high up in MI5, and in fact was one of the inspirations for uh, M in the James Bond novels. And he said, well, use my name as a reference, and even better, uh, he had a word with his own boss, Sir Vernon Kell, head of MI5, who also knew Weekly, and he said, use my name as well. So Weekly sent in his uh, application to uh, uh, the Ministry of Information again, and uh, guess what? There was no reply. So for want of anything better, uh, Maxwell Knight said, well, I suggest you carry on writing your books. Uh, the troops who are serving and the people at home will certainly need entertainment. So Dennis Wheatley did that, just that. He dusted off one of his little used characters, uh, a man called Gregory Sallust, who was um, a kind of uh, commercial investigator and secret agent who had saturnine good looks and was something of a lady killer and who was good with weapons. And if you think this sounds a little like James Bond, well, maybe some it fed in because Ian Fleming was much younger, but he and Dennis Wheatley were doing not dissimilar things later in the war. And uh, we do know that Dennis Wheatley invited uh, the young Ian Fleming to lunch. So maybe it is right that uh, we can see a little bit of James Bond uh, in these books. Anyway, Dennis Wheatley had what I think was a groundbreaking idea, which was he would write these books very fast and he would set Gregory Salas uh, missions in um, the things that were happening right now in the uh, papers. Uh, and so his first book, The Scarlet Imposter, in this series was published in January 1940. And it, he only took seven weeks to write, which was very, very fast by his standards. And uh, people could see what had been happening in the papers, and they could see that Gregory Salas was behind it all. And it was a great success. And uh, he carried on like this uh, until May 1940, uh, being successful as a novelist, but uh, secretly being secretly very, very fed up. And uh, his big break, the next phase came complete by accident. Uh, his wife, unlike Dennis, had found a job with MI5 and she was a driver. Uh, she was the chauffeur driving her own car and driving MI5 people around. And one day, the person she was driving around looked particularly miserable. So being the kind of affable soul she was, she said, what's up? And this chap, who was a captain called Hubert Stringer, said, I've been asked to come up with plans that civilians can use um, to resist invasion. And at this stage, the Germans had their Blitzkrieg, they swept through France and Belgium, and uh, the evacuation from Dunkirk was just about to start. And uh, the chiefs of general staff at that stage regarded an invasion as pretty much certainty. So knowing the urgency and at last being given a task that he rather liked, uh, Dan Sweetley went home and for 14 hours straight, he worked up his proposals into a 7,000 word paper, had them typed up by his secretary. And within 24 hours of Stringer having made this uh, slightly unwilling request, uh, Dennis Wheatley's paper was lanced on his desk and he had a look at it and I think it's fair to say his jaw dropped. It was punchy, it was full of very practical things and he said, Dennis, this is fabulous but there's just one snag. Uh, I'm fairly junior, uh, we've got lots of bureaucracy and I think by the time this comes to the people who need to see it, it will be too late. So Dennis said, well, I'm a fa famous author now, I've got influential friends. Do you mind if I'd send copies to a few of them? Uh, to his everlasting credit, Hubert Stringer said yes. And Dennis Sweetley sent off copies to three people, to an admiral, Sir Edward Evans, 
uh, to someone in the army called Colonel Charles Balfour Davy, and to a man called uh, Sir Louis Grieg, who was a very close confidant um, of the king. And the results, I think, it must be said, exceeded Dennis Sweetley's wildest expectations. From the Admiral, he got a, uh, a polite letter of thanks. Uh, Colonel uh, Balfour Davy wrote him a note saying, please come and see me about this paper at the War Offices at midnight. And, uh, you can't think something more romantic for a Dennis Sweetley novel if you invented it. But uh, thrilled to bits, I'm sure, Dennis Sweetley turned up at the uh, War Office at midnight, was sat down, and was told by Balfour Davy that his paper was so important that it was going to be laid before the Chiefs of the General Staff. Um, by the time that Dennis Wheatley walked out of the building, he must have been several feet into the air. I know, these things just don't happen in real life. But in a sense, best, better was to come. Uh, he uh, had a communication from, from Sir Louis Grieg a few days later, asking if he'd come to lunch at Dorchester. Uh, he duly did, uh, for what I imagine was a very nice meal during ration time. And uh, there he met uh, a, uh, a Czech arms manufacturer and a uh, group captain in the Air Force uh, called Johnny Darvel, who, who was later to become an Air Marshal. And Darvel confirmed what he'd heard, that his paper was going to be read by the uh, general staff. And he said the reason was that they'd have been expecting something from a writer of fiction to be uh, completely full of puff, and they'd be very surprised that it hadn't been. It contained very, very um, concrete suggestions, some which couldn't be done for reasons Dennis Sweetley didn't know, but some of which they took up. Uh, for example, as a measure against parachutists, uh, Dennis Sweetley suggested that all si uh, uh, town signs and street sounds, signs around the country should be turned round, so that if any enemy parachutists turned up and they thought they were going to Winchester and they looked at their maps, they'd find instead they were going to Portsmouth, etc. Well, it was never tested against the Germans because they never invaded, uh, but it certainly worked against the local populace who found it thoroughly confusing. And among his other suggestions were that they should get petrol tankers and have them standing by the beaches, uh, so that when people came to the beaches, they would flood them with gasoline and set fire to the water on the beaches. And he also suggested the grave stones should be smashed because they would have nice sharp edges and civilian population should set them in concrete as blocks to the, um, to the invaders. But I think what really shook them was the fact that in, in this paper, um, Dennis Sweetley said without a shadow of a doubt, if he was German, he would be invading from the south. He would come up into England through Sussex and Kent. Whereas the received wisdom at the War Office was that uh, any German invasion would come from the east. And Dennis was very proud when after the war they looked at German secret papers, but it turned out that the War Office was completely wrong and he was completely right. Anyway, for the next nine months or so, he became while a civilian, an unofficial one, one man think tank to the um, senior most people in the, um, in the armed forces. And he had a variety of remits. He was asked to write a paper on how to keep Turkey independent. Um, he was asked to write a paper on how to keep up morale uh, during the winter of 1940. And his solution there was quite interesting. He said, even if it has no military value, you should attack something that you can win so that people are buoyed up by a victory. And I think my favorite of these papers, and he, he wrote some 20 of them, all top secret and all while a civilian, was in the darkest days, Churchill wants to lift the mood and so he set his, ta uh, his staff the task of working out how they would reorganize um, Europe after they had won. None of his normal plans wanted to touch it. They thought they had much more important things to do. So they gave it to Dennis Sweetley. And he, his solution is still quite interesting. For starters, he was going to set up a series of neutral countries uh, between France and Germany, so they would never combine, which in a way is interesting because economically, if not politically combined, you could argue with the EU, they certainly have. Um, he suggested that the UK might one day become a 51st state of uh, the USA. 
So it was all very original stuff. And um, by the end of these 20 papers, um, it's quite, a, I only discovered this by picking up a piece of paper on eBay last year. Uh, some of the very senior people like uh, uh, Air Marshal Peck were sending top secret documents to Dennis Wheatley, just an ordinary civilian, so that he would know more and be able to better inform the papers that he wrote them uh, in, the, in his unconventional way. Anyway, by the end of 1941, um, they decided that Really, he was clo too close to things to stay out of uniform. And a very useful opportunity arose because they've been doing deception planning out in the Middle East for some time. The idea of you're going to invade in A, so you make the enemy think you're invading in B, so to make your task earlier, but it never really caught on in England. So they're going to set up a team of three to kick that off in England. And they had a man from the war office. They thought they had a man from the Navy, although he never turned up. And they decided to put Dennis into uniform in, um, in the RAF. Um, so he began in 19, at the end of 1941 as the lowest of the low as, as a pilot officer. But it must have been quite fun to have been on his, um, uh, his interview because when you were applying to be uh, an officer, you had to be interviewed. And he went to the interview and the, uh, a uh, man behind the table took one look at the signatures who were sponsoring him, and he said, well, it's obviously no point in my asking you anything. Why don't you ask me a few questions? So Dennis did his um, two weeks, well, it was going to be two weeks jaw bashing in Uxbridge, but uh, actually for most of the time, he spent his time uh, behind a shed drinking brandy with uh, uh, one of the other uh, uh, intakes. And then he started off, um, as a deception planner and what he did was completely unknown and he was very junior and it could have been very embarrassing. And uh, he recounted that in one of his first meetings, he went to a meeting, Pilot Officer Wheatley, which was full of high ranks and an admiral started talking about his latest mission and went on to say what he was going to do for deception plans. At which stage Dennis Wheatley, who was never shy, gave a discreet cough and said, uh, I'm sorry, sir, the future um, uh, operations planning staff won't permit that. Uh, the Admiral went bright red. Those who knew Dennis uh, tried to restrain their laughter and uh, well, the Admiral backed down. But uh, things really changed when a man called Johnny Bevan, Colonel Johnny Bevan took charge of the deception planning unit. Um, in civilian life, he'd been a very respected stockbroker, and he was known to both Churchill and to the uh, uh, Chief of General Staff, Lord Allenbrook. And uh, originally it was just uh, him and Dennis Sweetley. And I think probably at first they didn't get on because Dennis Sweetley was very unconventional, did things by the hoof, uh, whereas um, Johnny Bevlin, Bevan was a stickler for the book. Uh, but be that as it may, um, in the summer of 1942, they were given their first uh, important task, uh, which was Operation Torch, which was the Allied um, landing of a huge armada of troops in French North Africa. It involved bringing huge quantities of ships over from the USA, uh, gathering them all together uh, and taking them into the Mediterranean, um, at which stage the enemy would definitely know what was going on and somehow not to get them all sunk. Well, between the two of them, they came up with a series of plans which were leaked through various means, um, but perhaps most importantly by uh, double agents because during the war, Germany sent over a, a lot of agents and amazingly, it seemed all of them were found and all of them were either shot or turned. And they were all fed different things about this, different um, destinations. And by the time they landed um, on the shores of North Africa, not a single ship had been lost. So as Dennis Sweetly rather modestly put it, Johnny Bevan had earned his spurs. Well, they both had. The team was gradually expanded. Um, it was given the rather curious name of the London Controlling Section, uh, a name deliberately chosen so no one would know what it did. And 
one of Dennis Sweetley's jobs, therefore, was a, one which he must have enjoyed rather, which was going out with senior officers and uh, whining and dining them uh, to tell them what was going on. And uh, on more than one occasion, he would uh, arrive back having achieved, I dare say, his objective uh, and find the nearest bed, not minding if it belonged to a cabinet minister in uh, Churchill's underground bunker and dozing off on it for a few hours. Um, and amazingly, he was never caught. But by, by the time that the uh, Normandy invasion came, uh, the central team was one of seven and uh, a most extraordinary crew which had this stockbroker at the helm, Johnny Bevan, best-selling novelist. Uh, the other members included someone who in civilian life had run a soap factory, uh, another person who had been a tea planter in Ceylon, another person who had been a playboy. And incidentally, among their juniors, they, they had the actor Douglas Fairbanks Jr. And they came up with all these schemes. Uh, how, how anyone allowed them to recruit these people, I, I will never know. But uh, the normally de landings were certainly their finest hour. And by, by now, Dennis Sweetley had uh, been promoted from pilot officer to wing commander, although he always, of course, sat behind a desk. And it was this team of seven who came up with the idea that whereas we were going to land in Normandy, which was really top secret information, of course, we would make the Germans believe that our army was in Dover and we were going to invade uh, the shortest possible route in Calais. And they invented a non-existent army called the first US Army Group, FUSAG. And General Patton, who had misbehaved by slapping a soldier in Sicily, was made to kick his heels and pretend that he was in charge. And uh, lots of spurious radio traffic was generated. Um, dummy planes were made up out of rubber and wood to persuade the Germans what was there. They were sometimes caught though because there was one occasion where a German plane uh, went over one of these uh, uh, dummy airfields and dropped a dummy bomb, just so they knew that they hadn't got it all that way. But they came up with all these ideas and it wasn't just the ideas, it was the way they implemented them. And Dennis Sweetley was a very, very organized person. I think we can perhaps see his hand here. They effectively had what you might call the precursor of Excel spreadsheets. They would have a list of people, double agents, etc., down one side, and down the other, they would have over time what they would leak to all these people. So that effectively they were creating a huge jigsaw. Uh, they were then scattering all the pieces, feeding them out to people over time, so that the Germans would think they were very clever putting them all together again, not realizing that the picture that they had been given was a completely false one. And they were so successful that even seven weeks after the uh, landings in Normandy, uh, the Germans still thought that the main force was being uh, held up in Dover. And um, so as not to blow all their double agents, the, uh, the Allies were quite clever. They didn't let on at that stage that uh, uh, the forces in Dover had been non-existent. They pretended that they'd been transferred over to uh, the force in Normandy. Uh, so the cover of all their agents went, wasn't blown. But um, effectively by this stage, the job of um, Dennis Sweetley and his colleagues was done. Um, such deception planning was needed after that. And I don't think it was science because it was pretty obvious what was happening it was done by the Americans. And um, he, um, he went out of the uh, army in uh, December, 1944. But um, I think there can be no better tribute, actually, uh, than to quote the final paragraph of the uh, uh, letter of thanks, which um, was given to the group uh, by Major General uh, Leslie, who was Churchill's uh, Deputy Chief, Chief Staff Officer. And he wrote to them, the Chiefs of Staff instruct me to inform you that they wish to take this opportunity to place on record their warm appreciation of the outstanding contribution which the London Controlling Section and its subsidiary sections in the operational theatres uh, have made to the success of the various major operations which they have carried out during the past two years. In their view, uh, the record of success has been unique. Uh, I think one could say no more than that and opinions vary, but at the time it was thought uh, that um, the unit of which Dennis Sweetley was 
actually the oldest member, because he came in before Bevan, uh, had to, at a minimum kept 400,000 soldiers in the wrong place uh, when they should have been resisting the invasion. And I think not unreasonably, this was the moment in his life of which Dennis Sweetley was always most proud. 